Hello and welcome to Wine Blast. We are here with lots of wine and very big smiles on our faces. And in this episode, we are talking all things Beaujolais. Yeah, yeah, I think... These things are all certainly connected, aren't they? The mm. wine, the smiles, Beaujolais. You know, thinking about it, I think it's 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 hard even to say the name Beaujolais without smiling, isn't it? Mm. You know, try it, try it. Bo- <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna laugh now. But Beaujolais, 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 Beaujolais. 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 You know, it just Beaujolais. sort of makes you smile. I don't know why. Maybe it makes the you feel jolly. It's true in <laughs> Jolie. Um, it's it kind of it's hard to say in a downbeat way. That's Maybe. true. That's that the thing, is isn't true. it? That's and true. that's a great thing. It's, it's a rare thing, that, in wine. And I think... Maybe it's just one reason for, mm-hmm. for many others, among many others, to spend a bit of time on this topic, this you know wine region, which I think everyone knows, but maybe for different reasons. Yeah, I mean, yes, yes. And it's a fascinating region right now because mm. there's so much going on. Yeah. Uh, there's tons of history, but also loads of new things and, and people yeah. just... I think just lots to talk about and taste. Mm. Anyway, here's a view on Beaujolais, which I think captures a bit of what we're talking about. Beaujolais has always made great wine, but I think it's coming back into vogue. I really do hope so, because it's just such a joyous drink to have. David Roberts, MW of Goodhouse & Co, fine wine merchants there, neatly summarising the situation, I think. Uh, Now, we've wanted to do this episode for some time. So we've hooked up with the nice people at Inter Beaujolais who are sponsoring this programme uh, and who've been brilliant at hunting down precisely the people we wanted to talk to uh, and helping source the wine gems we were keen to taste and recommend. Also, we can take a fresh look at Beaujolais as it is today. We're very grateful all round, aren't mm. we? Yeah, mm. yeah. I mean, it even meant you could uh, you could fool around trying to recreate a scene from a famous TV series <laughs> which featured Beaujolais wine, <laughs> which you then put out on social media. Yeah. And I yeah. have to say... I I, I genuinely had no idea what you were doing. And I still don't. <laughs> but that's OK. I didn't know you were going to bring that up here. Anyway, fair enough. Yeah, it's a bit niche. It's a bit niche. It's a series called The Look Last of Us. It. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but um, I haven't actually seen it yet. Oh, but I did dear. see uh, via social media that it featured a shadow Beaujolais very prominently in a sort of post-apocalyptic context. As you do. As, um, you as, as, as you do, yeah. And I suppose I was just having a bit of fun. And, and people seem to pick up on it and join in the fun. What can I say? You, you know, and your just, social uh... media is all I can say. <laughs> uh, anyway, on that note, um, I think it's a good moment to say thanks to everyone who's been in touch lately mm. um, via social media mm. or email or speak pipe. Lots of you have. Uh, we haven't been able to reply to everyone or feature everything, but we will try. In mm. the meantime, uh, if you have been saying nice things about us um, and all the podcast, please Please do consider leaving a review and rating on your podcast app or platform. It really helps other people find us and and join in too, which is, of course, good for our numbers. But either way, we just massively appreciate it, don't we? Narcissist that we are, indeed. Right, (laughs) so uh, so on with the show. Uh, Beaujolais. 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 Uh, it's, It's a region... Sandwich between Macon to the north and Lyon and the Rhone to the south. Is that a baguette sandwich? <laughs> it produces around 65 million bottles annually, which is almost as much as the rest of Burgundy wine regions put together, apparently. Mm. Uh, it's 94% red wine production, uh, but a bit of it is white, made from Chardonnay, uh, and there's a bit of rosé too. Uh, it's a land of small-scale winemaking. Uh, the average domain is about 8 hectares, which is not very big, um, but that's enough of facts and figures, I'll restrain myself. Instead, <laughs> yeah. let's do an um, an association game okay. here. A bit of brainstorming, if you like. Go on, so, go on. when I say Beaujolais, what are the first words that spring to your mind? Oh, good one, good one. Um, I think our listeners would have lots of views on this. Yeah, uh, but for me, I think, I, I think, I'm, <laughs> do you know what I think immediately is a couple of very nice bottles on our wine rack. Um, you know, some of our favourite growers uh, and the Beaujolais crew wines, I have to admit, mm. um, like Morgan Cote du Pie and, and Fleury, which they're just a bit of a treat. And we've enjoyed them a lot over the last few years. We have, um, we have. Yeah, but, but I mean, to be serious, in terms of the bigger picture, I'd say... Beaujolais Nouveau is an obvious mm-hmm. immediate association. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then also more recently for me, natural winemaking is something mm. I associate now with yeah. Beaujolais. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, what about you? Yeah, okay, that's, that's good. Um, well, I remember the sort of etched 
burned, scarred into my psyche is having to learn about all the 10, <laughs> remember, and learn about all the 10 Vogelay crew, <laughs> the, the top sub-appellations in the region for so many exams mm, so over true. the years. Very I'm sure true. that'll be uh, nice a, sh- a feeling shared by many, you know, Fleury, Morgan, Moulin Avant, Brie, don't forget Côte de Brie, of mm-hmm. course, as well. And several more that. that we never But um, then, you know, I agree, it's, it's, it's sort of actually been a joy to then discover them and get to know them better just by drinking the wines um and there's so much to discover isn't Mm. there you know so i you know to go in a slightly different direction from you though in terms of associations you know i'd associate beaujolais with being trendy right now Mm -hmm. um generally offering pretty good value it's an area to go for good value wines i'd associate it with the red uh, gamay grape um, Absolutely, or yeah. Gamay Noir Juste Blanc, to give it its full title, which is a cross between Gouet Blanc and Pinot Noir, which I didn't know. No, there we go, no. has Pinot in its heritage. Uh, I'd also say Beaujolais with uh, associate Beaujolais with carbonic maceration. You know, the this sort of unique fermentation method commonly employed in Beaujolais, where you stick whole bunches uh, of grapes into the vat, uh, and which give the wines a sort of bright, uh, expressive, kind of lifted character yeah yeah i mean those are really really yeah all, all good points um mm. but let's not forget also the latest development in beaujolais is um is applying for certain sites to be granted premier cruise status which yes. is a big deal isn't it yes, 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 yes anyway so lots to explore and catch up on definitely time for a fresh look at beaujolais as you say um not to mention a fresh taste mm. because we'll be tasting and mm. recommending some wines some later on ideas. too mm. you've got your hearty mm. drinks don't drink yet We'll never get through it. Um, Anyway, but Beaujolais is famous for making really refreshing, characterful reds. And I Mm. think that's exactly what people are after at the moment. Mm. Authentic wines that won't break the bank, but which are upbeat and a bit lighter in alcohol. Ideal when doing a podcast too. Uh, You know, and and, 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 (laughs) you're absolutely right. This is this is the this is the trend. This is what people are looking for. Um, and, And also worth adding maybe an alternative to Cote d'Or reds the big names of the Cote d'Or mm-hmm. burgundies you know which are in ever shorter supply and ever pricier because of it yeah. you know um, this was something we explored in our last episode wasn't it on, on, on Burgundy, burgundy. Um, and one of our interviewees in that programme David Roberts MW of Good House uh, who imports some truly stellar Cote d'Or producers said he thought Gamay might start creeping into the Cote d'Or to replace Pinot Noir with spread wow. because of global warming but anyway heard it um, first well, Leave that to one side. <laughs> I think it I, might be one. At that point, I did actually take the opportunity to ask him about what he thought of Beaujolais in general. I wouldn't say that it's our specialist area, but it's something that we do want to do more. I mean, I love a good quality uh, Beaujolais. I think that it's early days seeing the Cote d'Or producers sort of vinification style and élevage style uh, going into to Beaujolais. I think that there are going to be certain appellations notably probably Moulin Val, which has that ability to cope. Um, but actually, I like, you know, many of the classical Beaujolais styles, and I think it's really exciting. And I think that um, what we're seeing with pricing uh, in the Cote d'Or will encourage people to sort of go back and look at Beaujolais. And I think that, you know, Beaujolais has always made great wine. It's just suffered, unfortunately, from uh, the image of Beaujolais Nouveau. But actually, that was only one small proportion of Beaujolais as a whole. And the traditional growers there have really paid the price unfairly and they've suffered. But I think it's coming back into vogue. I really do hope so, because it's just such a joyous drink to have. You know, it might not have the complexities of you know, great quote door, but it's still a great drink. David, thank you very much indeed. Okay. All right. Pleasure. Thank you. So I think it's fair to say that Cote d'Or Burgundian producers have been getting involved in Beaujolais for some time now. And at the same Mm. time, Burgundy lovers have been looking to Beaujolais as an alternative to Cote d'Or Reds. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and and, and I was interested to try it at the Homme Primeur Burgundy this year, you know, among the lineup from from Domaine Thibault, Ligier Bel Air, you know, uh, mm. uh, Moulin Avant, uh, of course, you know, a, re- a real step change from the Pinot Noir based reds, the Chevrolet Chambertin, and what mm-hmm. have you, mm-hmm. but also properly delicious and complex and joyous in the wider Burgundy mix. Yeah. So it sort of reminds you that that you know, while the wine styles are quite different, these two worlds are very close. Yep, yeah, and and of course, one of our first trips to the region was with Louis Jadot to mm. Chateau des Jacques in romanes yeah, yeah, Um But of course, Jadot is better known as a Côte d'Or négociant. Yeah, um, I think it'll be 
really interesting to see how this trend plays out and, and mm, develops. Mm, um, mm. In the meantime, of course, there are lots of there's lots of homegrown talent in Beaujolais mm. um, or growers who don't have any connection with the Cote d'Or. Um, and on that note, I did want to pick up on something mm. David mentioned: Beaujolais Nouveau. Yes, you mentioned it before. The elephant in the room. I think it's a bit unfair uh, to say that, but uh, it's definitely, as David implies, been something of a mixed blessing for the mm, region. Yeah. Um, just just to recap, Beaujolais Nouveau was dreamt up in the 1950s as a great way to shift lots of wine just shortly <laughs> after the harvest. Um, they set the date for Beaujolais Nouveau Day as the third Thursday in November every year. Um, it caught on and soon there was a race to get from London to Beaujolais and back. It became a thing and you can't deny it was fun, which was. is why it yeah. isn't all bad or no, wasn't all absolutely bad. Not. It's genius, uh, of course. But you know, equally, the quality of, of the wines, particularly in latter years, was often pretty basic, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, and, and because of the way they're made, you know, fermented quite fast in the Beaujolais style, they're just, you know, I don't know, often just quite basic. And, and the yeah. style has been described as sort of banana bubble gum, mm. you know, which isn't mm. the, the nicest thing. It's okay. <laughs> but, you know, you could say that this trend or phenomenon does risk being something of a, you know, to pick up on the same theme of banana skin, you oh, know, for, like for, we did for, there. for the like region. We did there. Um, especially when, you know, when, when Beaujolais is trying to make ever more serious wines at the top end, you know, mm. and applying for Premier Crew status. And, and yeah, that, so, it's a good point. It's a good point. But I think, uh, to be fair, I think lots of wine regions managed to juggle producing both cheap and cheerful or easygoing wines at the bottom end with more ambitious stuff at the top mm, end. You know, mm. I mean, Rioja Joven versus Grand Reserva or single vin- single site stuff, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, anyway, I think Beaujolais Nouveau is less all-pervasive than it used to be. I mean, it still yeah. exists, but it is less. So maybe a better balance is being found. Um, mm. If you look at the figures, in the early 1990s, Beaujolais Nouveau accounted for nearly half of all AC Beaujolais sales, but it is less now. Um, mm. In 1985, there were 38 million bottles of Beaujolais Nouveau being made. Nowadays, there are just over 20 million bottles. Mm. So that would suggest it's maybe about half what it once was mm. and less than a third of overall production now. And, and, and you sort of think it can carry on, that it can be sort of repurposed, rehabilitated for, for, the, for the modern era? Well... Interesting you say that. I did ask this question of Caroline Santoyo, who works at Ante Beaujolais, and this is what she said. Yeah, I think there is actually a, a new wave of Beaujolais Nouveau. Um, it's being retaken and reclaimed by winemakers and also young consumers. So you have so many different Beaujolais Nouveau now, like the more traditional one, but also some some very uh, small batches uh, of wines that are made especially for the moment. Um, it's really a tradition in Beaujolais. And it's the opportunity of getting together in November when it's cold and rainy. And that's so, so it's very much a local tradition. Uh, it's a new taste of the vintage, of the new vintage. So you can see it in so many different ways. Um, the trailer of the new vintage, the the occasion to meet friends and have a drink, uh, enjoy something juicy and fruity uh, in the middle of winter. So many different uh, possibilities. A trailer for the new vintage. I like that. Very Hollywood. Yeah. And I love the idea of an excuse to, to get together when it's rainy and cold. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm totally on board with that, <laughs> as you might imagine. You know, I, I think it's quite rare that wine can be fun, uh, that it can be an occasion driver all on its own. Yeah. But I think Beaujolais Nouveau can work in this sense, um, as long as its quality is decent. Yeah, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, so perhaps now we can flip from one end of the spectrum to another, the top end of Beaujolais, you know, if you like, the, the crew, as they're called. So just to recap, you know, in Beaujolais, the key appellations are Beaujolais, uh, which is often pretty simple, uh, Nouveau falls into this. Uh, then you've got Beaujolais Village, um, which tends to mean wines with more concentration, sort of character, intensity. Um, they're still often really good value, so well worth looking out for that on the label, the village. Um, and then at the top end, you've got the 10 crew, as we've mentioned before, which are running north to south, uh, Saint-Amour, Juliana, Chena, moulin Avant, Fleury, Chirouble, Morgan, Renier, Bruy, and Côte de Brie. Oh, top marks, top Fran- marks. You, d- you didn't read thing. those at all, did you? got rid of my you? cold, actually, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, um, I have to say all that time spent drinking has paid off, hasn't it? There may have been some paper involved. But, uh, 
that. <laughs> anyway, so those crews don't have to put Beaujolais on the label, uh, mm. and their wines tend to be more complex and expressive. Mm. They're often made from low yielding vines on very steep hillsides and different regions are famous for different styles. For example, saint Amour is generally known to be juicy and charming. Girubla also light, but with a bit more steel in the mm. best ones. Mm. Um, while at the other end of the spectrum, you've got crews like Morgan and Moulin Avon, which tend to make denser, darker, more intense wines. Mm. And mm. then Fleury sits somewhere in the middle because it can make the lighter styles, but some sites in Fleury can give really quite intense mm brooding wines mm, I, I say just just having drinking a flurry but anyway i think that's absolutely key because you know you do get variation within the crew and that's important to say it's not often talked about but you know you just look at the crazy topography uh, on the map or by being there you know there's there's so many hillsides so you know sometimes there's a kind of 360 degree range in exposure around a hill or sort of mini mountain mm. um, and there's also some flatter land and you know and the soils are pretty varied as well aren't they absolutely and there's been some really detailed research done into soils and bedrocks over the over the past decade or so and they've identified over 300 different soil mm. types wow. now granite is a common shorthand when referring to Beaujolais bedrock and soils but it's clear now that that's just way too simplistic mm, um, mm. you get Devonian blue schist for example in mm. Juliana, Morgan, Côte du Pie and Côte de Bruy mm. um, you get the carboniferous pink granites of Chirouble and Fleury and then there's Sounds the like Triassic <laughs> <laughs> then there's the try. I'm, I'm on a roll here. Look, you know, sorry, I'm, I'm doing my stones. I'm doing, I'm doing yeah, my yeah, bedrocks. Yeah, yeah. like, like um, but stones. then there's the the Triassic, Triassic yes. sandstone and and clay on limestone of Moulin Avant or Saint Amour. Mm. And because of all of this, in 2018, Beaujolais was recognised as a UNESCO Global Geopark, which means it's an an area of outstanding geological heritage. I wish I had some outstanding geological heritage. Oh, you do. You do. Oh, do I? I'm sure you do. Oh, yeah, yeah, stones in your boots. Stones for brains. Um, <laughs> but, you know, think about it, this sort of complexity of the soils and the terroir is presumably what's led to the sort of ambition to seek Premier Cru status, is it? You know, for yeah. some of the region's vineyards. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so this is, it is. It's a big yeah. deal. Um, mm. I mean, Beaujolais has, has long had special vineyard sites. Um, mm. You know, the, that are known for making some of its most distinctive and best wines. For example, Les Torrins in Moulin Avant, mm. or La Madone, or Les Moriers in Fleury. Mm. And, and these are known as Lieu dit in Lieu French, dit. Lieu dit, yeah. uh, or named sites. And some of them have been around since before the crew themselves were created. Mm. Um, the earliest mentions apparently are 1747. Um, mm. but and the now, crew were sort of the crew. Okay, it was sort of 1930s or something. I think it was, Officially? wasn't it? Yeah, 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 a bit later. Yeah. Well, later on mm, anyway. Um, but yeah. yeah, much much later than the mid 18th century. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so anyway, what's happened is that there's a move now for, to get some of these Lieu D elevated to Premier Crew status. Mm. And that application is is happening right now. Right now. Right right breaking, now. News, breaking news. Uh, rare thing in wine. So that's quite a big step for Beaujolais isn't it mm. you know the the yes these are sort of historic sites but this this is kind of raising the game isn't it it's raising the stakes potentially taking Beaujolais to you know another level putting it more on a par with the coat door and the sort of more hoity-toity Burgundian regions and vineyards. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. With all <laughs> that entails. Mm, um, mm, anyway, either yeah. way, it, it is quite exciting. So we thought we should get the inside steer on this process and mm. really get to grips with what it will mean for the region and for us, you know, as wine drinkers mm, too. Yeah. Uh, so I spoke to Gregoire Oppenau, uh, a gr wine grower based in Fleury, but also the secretary of the Fleury Crew Association, which is essentially the organisation that promotes the Fleury Appellation. Because, because Fleury is sort of ahead of the game in terms of applying for Premier Cru status, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so the application process is a bit complicated. <laughs> you surprised you... me. <laughs> we're, we're in France. <laughs> um, but essentially, you have to present the gods of French wine law, the IN. AO or INEAL, uh, with mm. compelling evidence that a vineyard site deserves Premier Cru status. Mm. Of course you do. But this includes, just, um, just to make it clear, it includes documentary evidence going back decades. It includes tastings, uh, press and critic ratings, mm. um, harvest declarations, sale price records, you know, all citing these lieux and proving they're worth it, basically. 
I think I'm worth it too. Maybe I should apply. What do you think? <laughs> because you're worth it. Because... <laughs> Pete's um, Premier Crew. Bah, Premier Crew. Premier Crew Pete. Richard. No. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know Pierre about P- that. Um, but back to the wine. I, it sounds like quite a job. Yeah, I, well, you're not kidding. It takes. I couldn't believe it. it takes years of work. I mean, Gregoire told me that they um, they and Fleury have been working on this for five years now, mm. and they still mm. need to get final sign off from the Fleury growers, and then they're aiming to submit the application to the INAO in April 2023. You know. Um, you know. It sounds like quite a complex and bureaucratic process, to be honest. Isn't it? I imagine getting everyone to agree can't be easy either. No, no. But I think it's a battle, frankly, that needs to be fought on many fronts. Mm. Um, anyway, this is an intriguing issue, one that's playing out right now, as we say. So I had quite a few questions for Gregoire, but I started by asking him how much of the Fleury vineyard he hoped would be granted Premier Cru status. Ah, we wanted uh, uh, maybe the, the most part of the patients. No, but to be to be serious, to be honest, ENAO accepts between uh, twenty to thirty percent. So us, we will uh, will present around thirty percent, and after we will uh, we'll have a, a discussion with the ENAO, and probably the ENAO will say, so oh, this part of the body uh, can't be a premier cru." of uh, this UD, this old UD can be a point group. So we hope that between 20 to 30% of the, um, of the appellations will be in, uh, in Premier Cru. And can you name any sites that um, you're hoping will be given Premier Cru status, you know, and what are, say what their particular characteristics are within Fleury? I can't. <laughs> no, Top I secret. Can't. I, I can't because uh, it's not officially. It will take a long time with the ENAO, maybe 10 years, before they, they valid the, the, the UD. Me, I have my favorite UD. Uh, there is some UD like Lamadon. I'm not a producer in Lamadon, but Lamadon is like an, uh, uh, the most famous UD in, uh, in Fleury. So certainly, uh, Lamadon will be a premier cru. But there is a problem with Lamadon. So Lamadon is a very large UD with all because it's a, it's a small mountain with all the different expositions. So uh, it's a bit difficult for us to present the all Madden. So maybe we'll present just a part of Madden. Uh, for the other UD, I know the ratings we did, but I can't communicate on, uh, on that because uh, after it, the Reno won't be very happy if we communicate uh, before, before they, they decide. And you said something about it taking 10 years. Is that how long it's going to be before we will see Premier Cru yeah. Beaujolais wines? Ten, another another ten years. Yeah, 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 yeah. It it took it took ten years, for example, for Puy Fusé. They they they, uh, they have the first the first vintage in Puy Fusé. It's uh, twenty or twenty one. I don't remember. And they begin their work around uh, two thousand ten. If if Fleury is the first Beaujolais Cru to submit an application to the INAO, which of the other ten are also sort of Pretty much ready to a- apply. Oh, yeah, they, they, in the ten crews, there are Fleury are in advance. Bruy and Côte de Bruy are also uh, well in advance. They will they will maybe present not this year, but the, the year after. Juliana also, and there is some other. Uh, for example, Morgon, it's much more difficult because he, us we have maybe uh, uh, thirty beauty, but then in, they, they, they they are in Morgon just. Six big beauty, so that could be more difficult for them. For us, one of the joys of Beaujolais Cru wine is that it's much more affordable than the increasingly unaffordable Cote d'Or reds, you know, from further north. Is the risk of gaining Premier Cru status that the wines will become more expensive and then potentially kind of lose that lovely appeal that they have because they're great value? Uh, it depends for consumer. That could be a risk for us. That's our objective. Uh, you, you know, uh, our production costs in Beaujolais are much more expensive than in Burgundy, than in Champagne, than in this type of regions. Because we have high slope, we have high density, ten thousand uh, stocks per hectares. Uh, we have also the goblet pruning. So yeah. It's it's uh, it's cost lot a lot for um, for uh, for example to uh, on our soils are very poor like uh, granite soils are very poor so that's why we need for example a lot of per- lot of people because 
everything is made by hand. So when everything is made by hand, we need more people. And uh, so it's cost a lot. And just to explain that, that's to do with very steep slopes you can't mechanise. Yeah. Gobele trained vines have to be picked by hand. Um, so there's, yeah. there's a lot of um, impos- you can't mechanise, basically. Um, is, is that the reason, really? That's the reason. That's the reason. We can, we can mechanise uh, for new beans, because new beans, for example, more in the source of Beaujolais, we have, uh, we have more uh, different pruning. Uh, we, we, we have more um, cordon and also guillot. In, in, in the crew area, we begin to have cordon, but it's forbidden in a crew area to have guillot. So uh, that's why the source of Beaujolais, the classic Beaujolais appellations, we, we, we can mechanize the, the, the beans. That's why our production costs are lower in the source. That's why we can continue to have a good price value but not very low cost wines in the source of Beaujolais but in the north we need to increase our prices because uh, our production costs are very are very high. And just to explain the north is really where most of the the crew crew are are situated. Um, now among producers I know there are lots of people pushing for Premier Crew but there are also those who are against the idea. Why would they be? Oh it's, it's, I think, because they, they, uh, they don't understand. They think they will lose something if they don't have Premier Cru. But, uh, it's my opinion, uh, if uh, some vignerons uh, are in Premier Cru, they will say uh, better their wine. But for people they, uh, who, who don't have Premier Cru, they won't say their wine to a lower price. They will continue to sell to the same price, or they will they will uh, increase a bit their price uh, because the premier cru will be like uh, like a locomotive, you know. Uh, so I think some people will uh, will uh, win more, but everybody will win. But you know, in some time in the village, uh, people are a bit jealous if if their village are premier cru and they are not premier cru, they will be a bit jealous. But if you are uh, a good wine brewer, a good winemaker, and you make some good wine, you will continue to, to say the well your wine. And uh, the Premier Cru will help this uh, Beaujolais dynamic today, but today you can see in UK or in US or also in France, there is a huge dynamic in Beaujolais. So without the Premier Cru, uh, we, we, we will have this, we will continue to have this dynamic. So there's a certain going to be a certain sort of reflected glory for the the slightly more middle ranking wines from having the premier crews above them um, that suggests the region it's as a whole is um, a higher quality region. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So I mean, just as a final question, Gregoire, what would you say are the the big trends in Beaujolais right now? I think there is more and more passionate wine growers in Beaujolais. They don't, they don't, they are more sensitive about their grapes, about their parcels, about their lieu So uh, that's why I think there is more and more very good wine growers because uh, they are more and more passionate. There is the last generation, maybe they just do the job to do the job, you know. And now the wine growers in Beaujolais are more and more passionate by wine, by their wine, by their regions. And uh, for example, for the Premier Cru, if we finally in ten years we if we don't have premier cru, we will there is the, we will have something very good that uh, with the premier cru we had a lot of meeting with a lot of wanderers of the regions so they really know now how their their terroir are exceptional but before that because sometimes when you do the job because you need to do the job you don't know that. So with this type of things, they release really that, and uh, that's why there is a huge dynamic in uh, in Beaujolais. Gregoire Offreno, thank you so much. You're welcome. So it sounds like exciting times for Beaujolais, really. But mm. but, but but equally, I'm hearing that this process may well end up with prices going up. Um, when what we've loved about Beaujolais historically is you can get such amazing value. Wines. I know it's true, isn't it? Um, um, you know, and Gregoire was really quite honest about that. Um, but mm. perhaps, 
perhaps a, a correction, if you like, is only fair. You know, you can get amazing wines at 25 to 30 pounds from Beaujolais right now. Mm. And, and it is really hard work there, winemaking, wine growing. You heard what he said, you know, a lot of it is done by hand because of the really steep slopes mm. and the fact that many vines are Goblet, so so individual bush vines rather than the Guillaume VSP wire trained Pinot Noir vines you see in the mm, in the mm, north of Burgundy, mm. and and the risk is if you if they don't get a fair price for their wines that that jeopardises the future of the region. Mm. Didn't I read somewhere that, that something like half the growers in Beaujolais are going to be retiring in ten years or something like that? Yeah, that, that absolutely sort of right. Yeah, there. yeah, and I I think you know let's face it, the, the prospect of extremely hard work for not much money is a real risk for Beaujolais' future. You mm. know, which is why it makes sense to try to build some value in for producers, you know, to encourage more young winemakers to come mm. in, to support and, and just safeguard this heritage. Mm. Um, mm. Maybe also to make things clearer, you know, it, it's easier to recognise a premier crew than it is to remember which lieu dit are better than others. So if I the mean, label as, just says premier yeah. crew, you don't have to remember what yeah, the yeah. lieu dit is. As we know, how hard yeah. it is just to remember the crew name, never mind the, <laughs> yeah, the, the lieu dit. Can you imagine trying to remember all of yeah, those? Yeah. Um, you know, and one other thing to mention here, it's not as if Beaujolais has always been dirt cheap. Um, not that it is dirt cheap now, but mm. it, it hasn't always been a, a bargain wine. You know, apparently up till World World War Two, a bottle of Moulin Avant would cost the same as a bottle of Von Romanet Premier Cru. Mm, intriguing. Did you know that? Okay. I did not know that. No. There we go. There we go. And so I guess it, I don't know. It sounds like a sort of another period of transition now, doesn't it, in Beaujolais? Mm. Um, on which note, uh, I guess our advice would be uh, pile into Beaujolais now. You know, it, bye, isn't bye, that bye. always our bye, advice? Bye. Well, maybe. <laughs> we but, always find reasons to give but, that you know, advice. No, we did in the last episode on Burgundy say, look, these prices are mm. unsustainable. They're, a lot yeah. of them are unaffordable, nice wines and all. But yeah. actually here in Beaujolais, we'd say buy and buy now because, you know, we've heard the top stuff will probably be getting more expensive in due course. Yeah. So it's a good time to buy now. And, you know, generally speaking right now, the quality of price ratio in Beaujolais and, and Beaujolais crew is pretty amazing. Yeah. And we're going to touch on this with our tasting coming up shortly. Um, just to recap briefly at this stage, though, you know, Beaujolais is a region where the Gamay grape makes red wines, everything from gluggable nouveau to complex, serious wines in varying styles from the crews in the north. The region is now applying for its top sites to become Premier Crews, and this looks set to usher in a new era, as we've said, for Beaujolais. Now, one thing you mentioned at the start, which I think is fascinating, uh, is the connection between Beaujolais and natural wine. Um, our episode on natural wine has been wildly popular, as you know. So just explain briefly what that's all about. OK, yeah, yeah. So briefly... Synthetic chemicals like herbicides and pesticides became popular in farming after World War II to boost yields and profitability. There was also more and more intervention in processing food and drink, including wine generally. Mm -hmm. um, but some people were concerned that these interventions could disrupt natural systems and traditional wine styles. And a key figure in that resistance, if you like, was Jules Chauvet in Beaujolais. Wasn't he sort of called a viticultural prophet or something like that? Yeah, I have read that. Yeah. I mean, basically, he was a, a grower or small negociant, a, a scientist at heart. Mm. Um, and Isabelle Legeron, who we actually had on our natural wine episode, calls him the father of modern French natural wine. Uh, because, of course, all wine was natural once. Yeah, so modern, modern natural yeah, wine. Yeah, yeah, modern yeah. So wine. she also says the movement can't be attributed to a single individual. But his influence and that of Jacques Nopor led to the formation of the, and I put it in quotes, Beaujolais cluster of natural winemakers like Marcel Lapierre, Jean-Paul Thévenet, uh, Jean Foyard, Guy Breton, um, which was a pioneering force in the world of natural wine. Intriguing. Yeah. OK, so Beaujolais is a sort of hotbed of anti-establishment sort of punk winemaking. <laughs> I don't you know, know whether they'd call themselves In the best that. possible sense, you know, yeah, yeah. quite revolutionary in yeah, a way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, so on that note, let's hear from Xavier Tivol, who is one of the young mm. guns in the region, a, a grower in Chiruble, who makes natural wine. Now, I met up with him at a busy Beaujolais tasting in London, so please excuse the, the hubbub. Um, he's someone with a background you might not expect, which I found out when I started by asking him whether he came from a winemaker 
banking family. Absolutely not. I come from Normandy. I started in the finance industry, then consulting and nuclear industry. And I ended up in uh, biodynamics, uh, wine growing, uh, four years ago in uh, 2019. How on earth did that happen? I, was, I always have been passionate with wine. always wanted to make my own wine. And so one day I woke up and said, OK, it's right now because later I will be too old to start it. And you say your wines are natural wines. And why have you chosen to go down the natural route? Is that something that's very much in trend, in fashion in Beaujolais at the moment? It's a trend, but it's also it's a conviction for me because I want to make a wine that reveals the quality of the soils we use, of the grapes we use. And so I think that natural vinification helps us to find the, the real fundamentals of the wine. You also make a... So, so you're in Chirouble. Um, first of all, tell me about Chirouble. What, it's one of the crew of Beaujolais. What's specific to it? What are its specific characteristics, its flavours? So it, won, uh, it is the most high in altitude crew in, of the Beaujolais. So my wines uh, are at uh, around uh, 600 metres. Uh, we have slopes from 20 to uh, 60%. So the slopes help us to have a, make a great wine. And the soil really have uh, no deep. We've got 30 centimetres of uh, sand. I don't know in inches. <laughs> uh, and then we have the granite. So the soil are really poor. And the wine is really... In French, we say aérien, aérieurs. So that's the specificity of the Chirouble. And you also talked about using a, a, a Cote Roti barrel for one of your wines. I think it might be the Morgan, um, which is a wine that you obviously, it's not from Chirouble, it's from Morgan. Why did you choose a, a Cote Roti barrel? Honestly, I started with it because a friend of mine gave me the, free, the barrels. I was looking for barrels. Oh, I've got some. Just come take them. I took them and we said, OK, I won't clean it totally. It's just emptied. We use uh, cold water, and it's and that's it. Then I put my wine into it, so there are still tiny kinds of Syrah and Cote in the wood of the barrel, and so it make um, we share the aromas from Cote Roti and from Morgon. It's quite funny, but it's a very very small production. Uh, I only use five barrels, but it, we can find the animal side of the Cote Roti in the wine thanks to it. Sounds like a match made in heaven to me. Um, just tell me a little bit more about the, how you see the future for Beaujolais. You know, are there a lot of young people coming through? What are they thinking? What's the mindset? Do you all talk to each other? Do you share ideas? Give us an idea of the whole vibe of Beaujolais right now. We have a lot of young people coming in Beaujolais because it's quite affordable right now. You can start a domain in Beaujolais. You can't start a domain in Burgundy or in Cotroti. That's not possible. In Beaujolais, you can. So that's very really interesting because we have a dynamics of young winemakers sharing maybe the same ideas or more organic wine, more natural wines, working together to find the best way to make the good wine, working together to sell the wine also, and working together to transform the vineyards. Because we have to change something with the global warming. Maybe we, we have to open ourselves to new... So you might actually move away from Gamay, potentially? What, what would you move to? I'm starting to move to Chacarella, a, a, a typical cépage from Corsica. And I'm also using Vermontino and Claret for white wines in the next few years. Wow, watch this space. Xavier, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Love the sound of that Morgan Cote Roti mashup, <laughs> and and actually and and the Schiaccarello trials. I'm not quite sure how you pronounce that variety, I have but no uh, idea. there we go. I'm not even going to attempt to um, correct you. But you know that's innovation right there. How yeah. exciting! Yeah, yeah, that's really really yeah, exciting, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, so there's yeah. you know lots going on indeed. Yeah. Talking of which, we have got lots of wines here to taste, yeah. haven't we? So so so, uh, so we're going to um, move fairly rapidly, aren't we? Because it's going to yeah. take forever otherwise. Mm. Uh, but we will put all the wines on the show notes and further details on our website with links to boot, so you can mm. catch up there if necessary. Mm. Before we start, I should say that the Dementivol wines are really impressive, uh, mm. especially the Cheruble Amphorus. 
Is that how you say that? Mm, Amphora? Amphoras? Amphoras. Yeah, Amphoras. Uh, and the Morgan Sharma. We don't have those here, but they are terrific. Um, what we do have, though, is a pretty fabulous lineup. Yeah, you isn't drank it? all those by yourself, didn't I'm you? I'm so yeah, excited. No sharing there. Anyway, we, we do love a good Beaujolais, <laughs> don't we? Um, but the interesting thing now, I think, having said that, is, is there isn't just one style of good Beaujolais, is there? Not There's at a whole all. host Not of styles. Yeah. So we've got brilliant examples that, that showcase exactly that, haven't we? So, so all sorts of different reasons to like different, Beaujolais. Different styles of wine. Yeah, yeah, so to yeah, start yeah. off, we've got this one here the, the, the Beaujolais Village, Cave du Chateau des Loges, Les Trois Madones, 2021. It's quite a mouthful, isn't it? Please, you said that. Uh, it's from 9.99. It majestic so under a tenner and and you know we're starting classic because this is everything you want from good yeah. Beaujolais village Absolutely. it's sort of it's bright and and cherry fruited it's mm. fresh and juicy isn't it it's with yeah. a touch of pepper there it's just really upbeat and and with really good concentration it's kind of smashable smashable in a word go on go on if you're you going to use it if you spend your life wine. if you're the kind of wine drinker who spends your life sort of fleeing overdone syrupy reds this is the antidote right, it's yeah. so gorgeous it's, it's just it? gluggable isn't oh. it you know and I, I think it's probably worth saying at this point it is mm. often worth spending that extra one or two pounds on a mm. village wine for that extra bit of oomph you yeah, know it's absolutely. not it's not a massive difference it's just going to give you a just a better wine so we could either say Beaujolais village on the label or yeah. I'd say Beaujolais and then the name of the village after it which yeah. could be Lantigny or various other yeah, things yeah yeah which you village. know if you've got something like that then, then yeah. go for it yeah. um, and as we said this one is not expensive it's under a tenner yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. anyway up next another Beaujolais village but mm. this one is mad <laughs> <laughs> really? If, if, if the Trois Madon is a classic, a smashable classic, <laughs> yeah. this is revolutionary, mm. is it not? You know, it is a Marmite wine. <laughs> Some people will hate it. I mean, I, I don't know who, but uh, because I love it. Um, mm. It is the GAM, so G A M, and it's Domaine, and I can't say this. La Tuilière. La Tuilière, Gramoyon. Gramoyon, something well, like that. And it's a 2021 like vintage. Yeah. Anyway, who cares? It's an amazing wine. It's 14.95 at Cornium Barrow. I think that's a snip at the price. It looks cool and it tastes <laughs> funky. It's kind of, if we can try and describe it, I think anybody who likes really natural wine will understand it. It's, it's floral, it's kind of animal, meaty, mm. a bit of that stalky leafiness, but also juicy. Um, just very drinkable. Um, it's yeah. edgy, but I just cannot help loving it. The bottle just disappeared, didn't it? When we it opened did. it, it's one of those things you're, you're sort of contemplating. <laughs> well, the contents, the is bottle this good? still here. Is it faulty? <laughs> is it not? And then it's just like it disappeared. You think, no, it's just yeah. delicious. Is what it is. Yeah. It's loads of strange things yeah, put yeah. together, but it works and it's Beaujolais and it's brilliant. So yeah. quite a natural style, isn't it? You know, very natural. Semi carbonic yeah. maceration in the yeah. process, made with native yeast, vinified without sulphur, aged in big cement vats. You know, to be fair, it's a wine that just sort of dares to be different. And I, and I really like that. And I if you like that. something really, Absolutely really quirky, delicious. it's and brilliant. Good value too. So next up, a couple of our perennial favourites, both of which are pretty well distributed across you know, Europe, North America, Australia, Hong Kong. Uh, we did check on Wine Searcher for this. You know, so firstly, the Grayo Domaine de Far, Fleury Roche Guillon, uh, 2019. That's about 23.95 a yap. It's kind of... About... Uh, well, it is twenty three ninety five. Yeah, <laughs> it's flinty and kind of dark fruited. It's quite grippy. Lots of concentration there. And then uh, there's the Jean Marc Bourgault uh, Morgan Cote de Pique twenty twenty, and that is fourteen ninety five. So it's under fifteen quid at the wine society. It is amazing value. Again, you can get that all over. It We've just, loved that for a long time. It is we? such a good wine. Such good value. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of bloody and meaty and feral it's kind of dark it's a darker fruited graphite sort of richer version of Beaujolais quite savoury uh, again that's made using semi-carbonic maceration too Asian cement vax for 10, 10 months before it's, it's bottled two very serious Beaujolais styles mm, there mm, okay well if we're talking serious finally we are going to finish on a couple of wines that were just and are just sensational I love the Julien Sunier mm. Fleury uh, the 2020 was amazing uh, and the 2021 we've got here mm. it, it's, it's made in a natural style as we said um, about some of the other wines from the Grand Pré and La Ton Lieu uh, carbonic maceration with wild yeasts aged in old burgundy barrels unfined, unfiltered bit hazy mm. 
beautiful, ethereal mm. style. You know, it's yeah. gamey red fruit aromas. It's so fragrant, a very smooth, silky texture. Mm. It's it's quite fragile. Um, mm. It's quite delicate, yeah. but also savoury, subtle, really different to the two previous wines. Yeah. Uh, and only 11.5% alcohol, mm. which I quite like. And well, that's a point. That's a, I mean, that one is, is lower, but all these wines are pretty low in alcohol. Yeah. I mean, nothing yeah. gets over 13 and a half. That's no. a really common thread in, yeah, in, yeah. in Beaujolais. Yeah. But yeah. I, I do take your point. That is such a delicate, ethereal style. It is. It? It, it's right. one that you need to spend a bit of time over, mm. I think, because it, it can pass you by if you don't sort of concentrate yeah. on it. And, and and that's only just over £30. You yeah. know, I think it's about £31 from Robeson at the supplies. And we're talking UK. really top Beaujolais. But, you know, yeah. that's very, it's a well-known uh, domain and it's well distributed uh, across Europe, the US, Australia, Hong Kong. Um, now, what we, we've been saying about the winemaking does make me realise we haven't really had time to discuss carbonic maceration, this kind of winemaking no. technique, have we? But I think, no. to be honest, looking at the time, that's one for another day. Um, I think what we can say is that winemaking techniques do vary quite a bit in Beaujolais. There's a mix of modern and traditional approaches, but a lot of winemakers do this sort of semi-carbonic maceration. So you still use whole clusters. Uh, so you get a bit of that brightness, um, but you also get structure and density too, you know, like Julien Sunier. Mm, yeah, and then that, other people that, are just de- de-stemming and using more conventional extraction conventional te- red wine, techniques yeah. um, mm. and oak barrels, even Cote Roti barrels, as we as, heard from yeah, Xavier. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. And that's to make it a denser, you know, long-lived styles. Um, mm. And talking of longer lived, more complex styles. That's a very good lead into our last wine. <laughs> this is the Jean Foyard Morgan Les Charmes Eponyme. Uh, we mentioned Jean Foyard as one of the gang of four mm. natural wine pioneers mm. in Beaujolais. Mm. Now we were smuggled, um, I think that's the sort of right way to describe it, we were smuggled a bottle of the 2015 vintage of this by a brilliant sommelier, Chris Parker, uh, when we popped into In the Park, um, a fab local restaurant yeah, no one- he won Best UK Sommelier 2022. He wins what a Best legend. for me. What definitely. a legend. Because we were blown away by it, weren't we? We were. We just were. Um, so we, w- what we wanted to do was retaste the current vintage. Obviously, 2015, I don't mm. think you can get hold of it anymore. Mm. But the current vintage is equally, it's gorgeous. Um, 2021, isn't it? Yeah, t- 20, yeah. 2021. Um, again, it's around £30, maybe slightly yeah. more. Mm. Um, so not silly money at all. We're not looking at, you know, yeah. big coat door yeah. prices. Um, and it, it is well distributed. Um, Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, the US, Canada, Europe, UK. Yeah. Um, although I do think, although it's well distributed, it's still quite quite hard to find. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so yeah. thank you, Antoine Beaujolais, yes. for, for getting us this sample. <laughs> um, but it's just, let me just, beautifully complex. It's multi-layered. You've got dark fruit, but it's also floral. It's a bit gamey. Um, in your mouth, it's just so juicy and expressive and intense. Um, there's a definite feel of natural winemaking here. It's a bit wild, um, but also fresh and vibrant, you know, as you want a natural wine to be. It, it, for me, it's just a wine that you want to drink and drink and drink. It is utterly compelling. Mm, I want yeah. to buy some right now. Okay. All right, get, 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 get the credit get card the out. And then you go. We might need to finish the credit podcast card. first. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, that, bye, so, bye, bye. So, so this is grown in Les Charmes, which is the highest altitude Lyodie in Morgan. It's made using traditional whole cluster fermentation, but then aged six to nine months in old Burgundian barrels, and it's unfiltered. Yeah, so there we go. A, a smorgasbord of styles, of, of top wines mm. from, from Beaujolais. Um, you know, the perfect way to conclude our fresh take on the region. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, by way of brief summary, Beaujolais is a naturally diverse and historic wine region which produces everything from gluggable nouveau to ambitious cru wines. Uh, it's also a region where exciting things are happening, uh, be it natural wine, uh, a new generation of wine talent, or the application for premier cru status. Um, one very much to keep your eye on. And as we've said, it's one to buy while value for money is one of its biggest USPs. Mm, bye-bye. Um, our thanks to Ando Beaujolais for sponsoring this episode. Uh, also to interviewees David Roberts, MW, Caroline Santoyo, Gregoire Opono and Xavier Tivol. Uh, if you've enjoyed this episode, do leave us a rating and review on your app or audio platform. Thank you for listening and cheers. Cheers.